Hi, I'm Jonathan Bojarski, founder of saxophonisto.com. Welcome to this special Mummer String Band edition of the series, where I talk with some of the creative minds who have helped to shape that distinctive string band sound into what it is today. Many of these folks are personal heroes of mine, immensely talented individuals who often work behind the scenes to create the incredible productions showcased at the annual Mummers Parade in Philadelphia. In today's interview, I speak with Ray Mollick. Ray grew up as a mummer in Philadelphia and later served as music arranger for over 15 string bands, as well as for a number of fancy brigades. While growing up, Ray loved listening to the jazz greats live in Philadelphia, from Wynton Kelly to Horace Silver, Cannonball Adderley to Jimmy Heath and John Coltrane. Hearing those masters formed the basis for Ray's style of playing. His musical ability took him south to the Gulf Coast, from the Dixieland Lounge in Pascagoula, Mississippi, to Papa Joe's on Bourbon Street in New Orleans. That New Orleans sound became another huge influence on Ray's style. After his time in New Orleans, Ray moved back to Philadelphia, where he studied music theory and composition at the Philadelphia Musical Academy, and attended graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. His career then led him to Atlantic City, where he worked as a pianist and arranger. His last continuous engagement there was at the Showboat Casino, where he performed for 13 years. After his time in Atlantic City, Ray moved again to the South, and following a 10-year period of playing jazz in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, he now lives in Bucks County, Pennsylvania, where he continues to swing in his own unique way. Ray is so accomplished, so prolific, so talented, yet so humble and down-to-earth. What a wonderful man who has influenced so many. I'm thrilled to be able to present to you my interview with Ray Mollick. Hey, there he is. Pan Boyarski. <laughs> How are you, Ray? Hey, here I am. <laughs> it's good to see you. Same here, man. This is great. Hey, I love that shirt. Now you're talking. I got it, man. You know. <laughs> By the way, I, I'm not. I'm just talking right now. I'm not. I haven't started recording anything. I'm just talking to you. Don't I just matter. To... I, I'm just drinking here. You know, doesn't matter. <laughs> nice. Tom is a wonderful host. Tom I is a great host. For years. Um, so I am absolutely thrilled to be able to talk with Ray Mollick today. Ray has been a hero of mine since I was a little kid, and he's been an inspiration to so many of us who have wanted to learn to write music, so many of us who love string band music. He has been really the creator of a lot of the modern string band sound that we hear. Um, it's amazing to me when I look back now at all of the stuff that Ray has done over the years, all of the bands he has written for, all of the different types of themes he's done, just the tremendous variety, and really how he took the string band sound from the 1970s sound to what then became the 1990s sound of Furco with a lot of the 1920s jazz and, and banjo stuff and really amazing things that happened there. So I'm thrilled, Ray, to have you here and to be able to hear your story because it's really, you've been an inspiration to me and so many others. So thank you for joining me today. Ray, I, I, I want to just talk with you a little bit about, for starters, about how you got started in music. I know you have a musical family that you grew up in, and tell me a little bit about your background. Well, my folks are from Poland, so uh, we studied uh, when we were small accordions. I had a twin brother, and I think, I don't know, I guess we were about eight years old or something, and uh, uh, around the corner from us was the Polish American string band. So my pop used to take us over there to hear the string bands and uh, Joe Jankowski was the president and he said, he saw the little, us little guys, he says, uh, do you play? And we said, yeah, we played accordions. He says, come on into the club here. So that's how come we uh, joined the string bands. It was right around the corner from where we lived. And uh, so, uh, we played accordions, and then after a few years, I got interested in banjo, so I learned how to play uh, tenor banjo, 
And then after that, I played uh, bass fiddle. When I got to be a teenager, you know, bigger boy, so you play a bigger instrument. And that's how we got started in the string bands. And uh, we learned a lot of the old 1920 tunes. And it was a lot of fun going every week to the string bands. So your first musical experience really was with string bands. Yes, yeah, that's true, yeah. What, what happened after that then? Would you, you continued on in string bands for a while, but you obviously made a career out of music. What, what happened? Oh, uh, well, you learn to play uh, wedding bands, you know, and stuff like that, and, uh, different combos. So we had a few little good bands around our neighborhood that we were kind of playing every weekend at the, the Polish clubs in that area and, and different other clubs too. And um, so after that, what happened? Let's see. If you want to talk about uh, uh, what you listened to, I put the radio on. It was mostly, you know, what was happening at that day. Oh, we didn't have TV, TVs. Uh, but then we got a TV and all of a sudden Les Paul came on. To, uh, he had a show called the Listerine Hour. <laughs> Before Les and Mary do another song, look at this. The Martins have been happily married for a year, but something's gone wrong. Halitosis, bad breath, is no help to a happy home. Why depend on toothpaste? The most common cause of bad breath is germs in the mouth. So Betsy left Listerine by the basin where Bob would see it. Uh, you don't remember that, man. It was 1950s or 40s. And uh, I fell in love with guitar. I said, wow, that was so beautiful. So I became a guitar player also. And uh, uh, started to play, uh, you know, really pretty good guitar. And then uh, I heard uh, the other influence on me was uh, Ray Charles when I first uh, heard his uh, uh, album, uh, what was it, at Newport. Ray Charles Live at Newport. And he did, uh, I Got a Woman. And I never heard any music like that. You know, we were playing polkas. And, you know. All right. It's only because I got a woman. Oh, good guy. I got a woman over time. Boom, boom, boom. I got a woman. Boom, bam, ba do, bam, bam, bang, ticket, ticket, the ball, ba ding, ding, ding. I said, whoa, I got to learn that. So uh, Les Paul and uh, Ray Charles were a great influence on me. So I got to learn, you know, how to play like that. And then uh, Vietnam came. So uh, I had to go in the Army. So I uh, enlisted in the Air Force. Uh, Air aircraft control and warning systems I had to work on. So I had to go to Biloxi, Mississippi for a year, tech training to learn all about radar sets, how to fix them. And uh, while I was there, they had sort of community centers uh, where, where you can go on your time off on base and uh, play cards and you know, whatever the hell you wanted to do. And they had a piano up there. I walked into one of the community centers and there was a cat playing piano and his name was Jules Brown. So you think about guys who influenced you and he was playing beautiful jazz, man. He was from Brooklyn, New York and he was a teacher down there, you know, an electronics teacher. And I told, I walked up to him, I said, hey man, you playing some great shit, man, really good. He says, do you play? I said, yeah, I'm, I play bass. He says, well in the back room there, they got, instruments go out and get a, a old bass so i got a bass and we started playing like a duo uh, piano and bass and uh, he, he taught me a lot about well you know what was happening in jazz you know and then he said 
you know, I actually play bass too. Do you know a few chords on a piano? I said, yeah. So I played piano and he played bass. Huh. So we, we used to hang out together and he, he said, come on, uh, come on up to tonight at our, my barracks. He had a room, you know, and he says, I got some cold beer up there and I got an old Victrola, what we call a Victrola, it was a record player. And he says, I got some albums and uh, we could play them. So they were from, by uh, Art Blakey, uh, Horace Silver, Cannonball, Adderley, and he had a cello there. And he said, look, you're a bass player, I'm a bass player, we could play this cello to those records. So we used to have jam sessions in his room playing cello, pizzicato cello to all those great records. Oh, wow. And he, was, he was a great influence on him, on me. And he ended up being a bass player for Lionel Hampton. No kidding. Yeah. And then uh, let's see, another influence, there was another influence. So I played guitar while I was in tech school uh, down there at the Airmen's Club. And a guy came up, he was another teacher. And he said, hey, man, you play some good guitar. I said, oh, thanks. He said, would you want to play down in New Orleans with me at uh, nighttime? He, said, he says, I'll bring you back, you know, and, and you could, uh, you know, go to school and play down in New Orleans with me at nighttime. And his name was Lenny Dowenauer. He played tenor sax. So uh, I ended up playing down on Bourbon Street with him at nighttime at places like Papa Joe's and all that stuff. And yeah. I go to school during the daytime. So that's where I got that tink at the bam, bam, the doom, bam, boom. Yeah. You know, I got that, that Dixieland thing in me, man. Like, a, you know, a little funky wonky. <laughs> and uh, so those two cats were like uh, really good influences on me. And let's go further with the uh, mentors, I guess you would call them. Uh, after I got out of the service, uh, I went to music schools, Philadelphia Musical Academy and University of Penn. And I had a teacher at Penn, uh, an old timer, Constantine Vauclain. How about that for a name? That's a name, all right. And he taught counterpoint. And he was really terrific, man. I mean, I learned a lot about lines, how to put lines together, music, you know. And uh, I once past his office and I looked in and uh, I saw like a picture on the wall or not, it wasn't a picture but it had like Mozart's name on one side and then a lot of guys on, uh, after that and on the end he had his name I said what's that he says that's all the teachers that came or musicians that came from Mozart I said they came from Mozart and I said, you got a, a black magic marker, I'm gonna put my name on the end of that. He says, get out of here. So uh, there was another teacher down, uh, down there, uh, Richard Wernick taught uh, uh, theory and composition. And he was a great influence on me. What a beautiful teacher. He would, uh, every week he'd take a different era of music uh, and I was studying composition, you know, and he, he'd say, uh, we, you have to study that uh, piece, say like uh, this week, uh, take a Mozart sonata and find out the style, what makes that Mozart. And so uh, you would study it and he said, come back with something that you wrote in the style of Mozart. Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, so uh, the first week I came back and I didn't have, I just had about 16 bars. And I was really nervous, you know, and, and then he would play your composition on the piano and uh, criticize it. And he played mine and uh, he said, uh, that's Mozart. <laughs> Woo, I got through that one, you know. So he would go <laughs> through the different eras, you know, after Mozart, would you know, be, you know Schumann, Chopin, keep on going. And, and we had the right pieces in that style. So uh, he was a great teacher, you know. And after wow. that, uh, how did you learn? Right? So the years went by and uh, I uh, was asked to go down to uh, Atlantic City, the casinos, uh, as a pianist and uh, so I went down, you know, and uh, I played at the uh, 
let's see, I ended up at the Showboat Casino for 13 years playing piano with a lot of great jazz players. And uh, just to name a few that were good influences on me, one fellow was by the name of Vic Powell. And he was a Lithuanian guy from Pittsburgh. And he played with everybody, you know, Sinatra. And he was working with me at the showboat, you know, with a great Dixieland band. And he, wow. was, ter he was terrific. And our bass player was Lee Smith, a black dude from Philly, a soulful cat. And we just clicked together. His son is Christian McBride. That oh, sure. Yeah, so I played with uh, Lee Smith, his father, and Lee could play just like Christian McBride. Wow. So, uh, you know, that's part of the guys that influenced me. Wow, what a great, great group of, group of musicians that you've worked with over the years and learned from. <laughs> I was lucky. So, when you were in school, you were studying composition? Was that your, your yeah, I focus? Didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have any... Uh, what was it, uh, dexterity or anything, uh, discipline on any one instrument. So they said, well, you know music, so you're going to study theory and composition. So that's how I got into analyzing, you know, symphonies and sonatas and all kind of music. Yeah. When, when you, um, so you 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 basically did this. You were in school, and then you then you ba made your way to Atlantic City after that. After being in school, and you spent the rest of your time performing in Atlantic City for the most part. And, yeah. So what it was, I ended up playing piano at the showboat, like say from uh, eleven in the morning till three. Then I'd go home and do uh, arranging, and then I'd go out at nighttime from maybe nine to two or ten to three in the morning. And so that was my routine. Wow. And, and uh, at the showboat, sometimes other pianists wouldn't show up. So they say, Ray, could you fill in his shift? You know, so sometimes I'd have to work like eight hours at the showboat, you know, and, and go work at night. And one time I actually had to play three, three, four hour shifts at the showboat. They called me the Iron Man. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> so, it's a lot of playing, buddy. Now, what kind of, before I get into um, the Mummers arranging that you've done, what yeah. kind of groups were you writing for? Were you doing any, or any arranging for other bands at the time, either in Atlantic City or elsewhere? Yes, I worked, uh, I did uh, big band uh, writing. And uh, uh, let's see, one, a few shows. Uh, one of the shows I had to do was for the um, friend of mine, Ace Macero. He had a big band, and he uh, on a New Year's Eve, he said, Ray, I have a show to do for New Year's Eve, a 20-minute show. I want you to arrange the whole show for me. And I said, well, okay, let's see. What it, where, where is it? Who's it for? And he says, uh, uh, he gave me the, I forget which casino, and he says it's for Donald Trump. I said, oh, yeah? And I said, am I going to get paid, man? And he said, yeah, Ray, we're going to make sure that you get paid for this. So uh, I wrote it up, and they had one rehearsal before uh, New Year's Eve, you know. And it was great musicians. They could cite me, you know. And, uh, and I didn't know, but they added, uh, what do you call them, the, uh, showgirls from uh, Las Vegas to do dancing to these songs. Oh, wow. So uh, one song was uh, God Bless the USA or something like that. And uh, so I wrote it up and uh, they were dancing it and, and it was an afternoon rehearsal and at one part they lost their choreography and I said, what's the problem? And the song actually had one bar of 5-4. And I said to myself when I was writing it, I didn't know they were going to have dancers. Oh, and they, wow. were they were listening to the recordings of it. And I said, uh, well, well, let's cut that one out, man. Yeah, it ain't going to make no difference. It did. So the dancers could, you know, they were out of step. So <laughs> I, we had to add one, one beat 
to that one bar. And I said, I'd take $10 off what you owe me. <laughs> but that was, uh, yeah, I, I did shows like that down there. Yeah. Wow. That yeah. sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, man. Wow. And we had rehearsal bands down there too that uh, uh, some days, I think it was Tuesdays or something, uh, we get a lot of musicians together and every every week uh, I'd come up with new arrangements, you know, and this Ace Macera was a wonderful copyist. So I just give him the score and he would copy the parts out and we we do the arrangements, you know, every arrangements every week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. A lot of fun. <laughs> Now, during this period, were, were, were you considered, were you basically a piano player at this point, or were you playing other instruments as well? Yes, it, it, that, that's what happened. Uh, uh, I'll show you how, yeah, I'll show you, uh, how I became a, a keyboard player. I was a bass player. So I went into service, you know, came back out of the Vietnam era war. I came back to Philly, and they said, uh, uh, one night uh, I was home, and the guy called me, Ray, are you back? I said, yeah. They, he said, well, we, we really need you tonight. We, we're stuck. We don't have a, a guy. I said, okay, do you want the upright bass or the electric bass? And he said, no bass. You're playing Hammond organ tonight. I said, I don't know how to play Hammond organ. Uh, he said, don't worry. You're a accordion player. You can play chords. And you're a bass player. You can play left-hand bass. I said, I guess so. I don't know. So I showed up and... We got through the night, and uh, I that was when I just got out of the service. I didn't have a job. You know, I was going up to school. And he said, uh, you want to work six nights a week? I said, yeah, man. What, what You want the bass? He said, no, you're going to be an organ player. <laughs> so that's how I became a keyboard player. Wow. And then, uh, you know, so you learn on the, on the job. You know, I played a left hand, man. You've got to play like Groove Holmes, man, you know. <laughs> So uh, I made a, a, a good living playing organ, you know, playing six nights a week. And then some, uh, I play piano too. And that's when the guy said, Ray, uh, we need you down at, uh, down at the casino as a pianist. You know? So that's how I got to, you know, be a piano player. But I don't know, you asked me, uh, I can't even play a C scale correctly. I have no chops. I got a lot of soul, man, you know. You know, the correct fingering? Well, look at these fingers. They're all arthritis now, but I don't know how to play. And they say, oh, did you ever teach? I don't know. How to, I don't even know how to play the scales on a piano. Well, give me a tune. I'll, I'll rip the shit out of it. You know, yeah. So it's uh, the College of Saloon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you betcha. Well, soul is where it's at, right? If you got yeah, the soul man, and you, you got, got the a, ear, the rest of it. You got to swing, man. You got to swing. Yeah. Yeah. Jonathan? Yes, Jonathan. Tom. Yeah, a, a quick thing I wanted to mention to you. Uh, when you get into the string band aspect with, with, uh, with Wright, yeah. okay, he, he also did a lot of brigades. And uh, in fact, Dave Mazinski, you remember him, the costumer? That sure. Did all, yeah, he's here right now. And he reminded me of that. Like, uh, Saturn Aarons was his first brigade because I was drilling him and I asked Ray to write it. And he wrote the following year, and then he, he a lot of brigades called, which is a f totally different aspect because they're all brass trombone and you know all that stuff. That's true. So I just wanted to throw that in there, okay? If that would be uh, thank anything. you for the uh, yeah, thank you for the cue on that because we wouldn't have touched on that otherwise. So that's good to okay. know. Yeah. Um, by the way, Tom King, if you haven't heard in the background, Tom King is helping me conduct this interview from afar, and he's helped to facilitate getting Ray here. Uh, with me uh, this evening. So I'm very indebted to um, Tom for helping to pull this together. And he is our fact checker and making sure we don't skip over any important details as well. So thank you, Tom. That's a salute. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about Mummers now or a lot about Mummers. So you have an amazing uh, non-Mummers career. And I, again, what a, what a remarkable journey you, you took from, from going through the service, going down south, learning from some great people, and then making your way back up north and in, into the performance. How and when did you get into writing? I know you started playing with PA back when you were young, but how did you start writing for bands and when and under what circumstances? Okay, it was uh, uh, 
right before new uh, well give you a background about the arranging in uh, mummery most of the bands didn't have arrangers but in the 40s and the 50s uh Furco and polish american got great prizes because they had arrangers do their music so uh, the other bands they just uh, made up their own harmonies and uh, it was called bastard harmony you know it could be right it could be wrong but uh, uh polish american and Furco had these vaudeville arrangers to arrange in that style that they had so uh, how i got hooked into being an arranger pa about a few months before their new year's uh you know new year's day their arranger died and uh there was a the music director down polish american uh benny Seitek, came up to me and said ray we're stuck you're going to write the music this year you got to write it for us and i uh, i said what do you mean i i never wrote he says oh no, you could do it you could do it so uh <laughs> you, know, you look at uh, you try real fast to say how did they put the three sacks together and, and and listen to some of the old arrangements that they had you know and i remember playing bass uh to some of the uh vaudeville arrangers that the that that their arranger did and i i would listen and there was uh, i'd say how did he do it you know so basically it was three part harmony two alto parts off the top a tenor uh, on the bottom of that, that was your three parts. There was a good bass line, which was the bass fiddles and the bass sax. And in between the bass sax and the three part harmony up there was a, a roving baritone part, like yeah. a trombone. In other words, a trombone in a uh, Dixieland band. Mm. That was uh, when there was a lull in the melody, the old, uh, uh, that lower voice would give it a nice fill. So that's the style that I try to uh, uh, learn. And little by little, it worked. I, and I, I got the, you know, the feel of it. And, and it was a great sound. It was the sound that Furco had. It was a sound that PA had. And why that baritone was used away from the bass sax. It never doubled the bass sax. It was up in a, a little bit higher register. And that register that the baritone played was sweet. It wasn't like, if you put a fourth tenor down there in that, the fourth tenor would sound too rough. Yeah. But the barry was just beautiful. It sounded like a, a cello in that register. And uh, so that was the sweetness of the band. You had that sweet sound up the top, a beautiful counter melody in the middle, and a bass. So that's the sound that I, you know, kind of developed for a while. That's interesting. I never knew that the origins of that style was really a vaudeville origin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's that's the way it was. Yeah. And uh, you. So uh, what you, what I did was you got to do your research work. You know. So. Uh, who are you going to listen to that sound? First of all, Guy Lombardo, you know, Ben Pollock, uh, Rudy Valley, wonderful sweet bands. And they got that sweet sound. It didn't hurt your ear. And uh, that, that made it, uh, the string band sound so good. And the why Furco sounded extra sweet, they had three violins playing the melody up an octave from the alto. And it gave that beautiful sound. So uh, that that was the start of it. And were then, the other uh, bands were the other uh, bands using violins at all back then, or was it only Furco? No, nah, there were a few vi violins in every band. Like PA had one violin player, you know. But Furco uh, saw what they had, so they put those violin players right up it before the front line, and so they cut. And when they came up the street, they had their unique sound. So yeah, well, that was it. So uh, uh, as it progressed, I said, "Well, this is this is nice and sweet, but uh, let's let's get some hot sauce on this thing." Man. So who are we gonna listen to? So uh, 
uh, then you research uh, Paul White, then uh, Jack Hilton from England. Then you go to the black bands if you want to get a little bit more jazzy. Jimmy Lunsford. Sure. Fletcher Henderson. Look out. And there's smaller groups. John Kirby. So what you do, hey, get your ears out, listen, and transcribe some of this stuff and find out how they're doing it, man. It's not just straight melody. And it's not all 16th notes. It's, it's like contrast. So they'll play the melody one, one time, and maybe the next chorus they'll play a hot solo. Uh, I mean, a, a jazz uh, ensemble on it, or riffs, and different contrasts. And it, so after that, you say, what can I do after that? So uh, you vary the colors. You just don't give that counterpoint to the bottom. Give the counterpoint to the top and give the melody to the bottom. Sure. And then all of a sudden, hey, what are these banjo? They're real nice banjo players. Let's give them two bar breaks for contrast. And how about that bass saxophone player? Give him a few bars. So it was like painting a picture. It can be a dull picture, you know, black and white. But let's give it a color. Hey, well, we have a good drummer here. That's the color yellow. Let's put a little color of the drum. Give him, give him one bar of a, a, a lick. And it was like uh, you're painting a, uh, painting a picture out of uh, notes. And uh, but I consider notes. You just can't throw them out there. It's every note is like a diamond, and where you place it, it it's it got to be really important. But uh, after that, uh, the thing that you have to find is to be uh, uh, take different twists in, in uh, the melody. Surprise is the element, and novelty, you know. Uh, Spike Jones, look out, man. He's throwing the whole damn thing to you. Sure. But uh, I think the hardest thing to learn in arranging is... Uh, being novel and not well you can be off the wall you know but uh giving something to the music that is so such a surprise that it makes people's eyes bulge out can you do that man if you can you got it man so that's where you got to hit man you just can't you know write an arrangement a lot of notes yeah, I heard one guy, old guy say, I heard a lot of notes, but I didn't hear any music. So, uh, I, and oh, my arrangements, when I wrote them, my thing was, if I can't write that, if I can't play that part, I'm not going to write it. Mm. So every part that I wrote, I could play. Right. I didn't want to make it hard on the guys. But That's the, important, the, yeah. Yeah, but the thing uh, that was hard was maybe a little bit of a uh, twist that I gave, little surprises here and there that, that they said, what, what the hell did you do there? Oh, oh, I didn't know that was going to go there. Or like, uh, I thought it was going to be a chicken thing there. What, how do you do that? You know? And that, that was the, uh, the joy of like, coming up with stuff that you know, and you hope it would work. And most of my stuff is three-part harmony. If uh, you had something down the bottom uh, where the barry was a little weak, you would double it with another tenor. You know, you split the tenors up. And up to the top, sometimes you had to uh, DVZ alto parts for background. But basically, it was three-part harmony, you know. Yeah. So when you started writing for PA, that was around what year when you started doing that writing for them? I can't 67. Can't remember. About 67. 67 all, all the way up to 2000. And that was his last year. He stopped playing for everybody. So when you started with PA for a few years, then I guess other bands kind of caught on to the fact that you were writing for PA and they must have liked what they heard. So what, other bands started approaching you as well? Yeah, it got to the, well, we got good prizes, you know. 
and and then uh, so many other bands said, "Well, Ray, could you do this?" And you know, so uh, yeah, I got I bounced around. I you know, had a family. I had to make a living, you know. So uh, I, I became an arranger. And uh, some of my joys was there. There were bands that were not, you know, didn't have the horses that the big bands had, but they asked me to arrange for them. And I got more of a kick out of writing for a, a band that wasn't getting top prizes, you know, better than, you know, first prize bands. And, and it, it, the joy was if they got a better prize that year, I said, wow, yeah. that's really nice. Yeah. I just, before we continue on, I just want to show everyone how prolific Ray has been. And this list is not complete, but it does give you an idea as to how many shows Ray has done over the years. And this, this website is, is amazing. The, the, the Mummers database. And I really, what these guys have done with this is just mind boggling. Um, here with this list, you can get an idea for just how much stuff Ray has done. And I, I think that this is, doesn't even include it all. Cause as we said, Ray started back in, in the late sixties, but you can see he's written for, as we know, PA, but also Aqua, Trilby, Kensington, uh, U the Ukrainian American String Band, Uptown, um, Aqua again, Brumall, Juniana, um, Hegeman, Garden State, um, again, Ukrainian American, and of course, um, at, at South Philly, but of course, the um, golden years then in the mid 80s through the 90s when there were some amazing scores for uh, Polish American with uh, Dr. High Tech uh, with Greater Kensington and their classical theme and certainly uh, all of Furco's amazing winning routines. Um, well, well, the majority of his, their winning routines in the 90s which were just revolutionary and, and just changed everything from there. And as, as Ray talked about having that bouncing back. And I'd like to get back to that a little bit later with you, Ray, but just how you just incorporated all of those instruments in the band, gave them all their due. They all got their time to shine. And that was something so unique for, um, for the time and something that you created. So just wanted everybody to be aware of all that Ray has done. I mean, just look at this list. It just goes on and on. Avalon. Uh, Darling. I mean, I, I just can't get over how much you've done. Um, so, we were we were talking a little bit about different bands and how much you enjoyed the the challenge of writing for groups that were maybe not winning groups, but to bring them up a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. What were some of your techniques for writing for maybe some weaker bands? What did you keep in mind when you were writing for them? Well, there's one band that uh, uh, they couldn't do too good music wise, so you kept everything in C and uh, C, G, 7th, and F. And uh, it was a little rough, but uh, you got through it, you know. <laughs> and they still didn't do too good music-wise, but uh, I got money. <laughs> <laughs> now, what were you doing? You were writing for, when I talked to you uh, the other day, you said you were sometimes writing multiple shows in a year. I mean, how many how many routines were you writing in a given year at your peak years? I, I don't know, man. Uh, Tommy's. Oh, uh, a, a year? I'll probably say he did at least eight string bands a year. Now, this is when it was like twenty-seven bands and twenty-five bands, you know that 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 area. But he has done eight, if not more, bands a year. And his brother Joey said, Ray, do you know that you wrote one year, you wrote half of the b bands? You wrote half the parade. <laughs> I said, no, I didn't know. <laughs> uh, now, what would happen if a band would come to you and say, we, we want you to do a theme and it just something you couldn't. Was there ever a theme that you were like, I just can't even wrap my head around this. I just can't. I'm not feeling it. Or did you always find a way to make it work? No, you always you always got it. Some some things oh, were some things were were a little rough. There were bands uh, uh, they'd say, "Okay, Ray, uh, we want you to do this," and the music director wanted to put twenty four tunes in this thing. 
So he'd start out with, you know, one tune, eight bars, and he'd go into the next tune. And I said, man, you know, what are you going to do here? You know, it wasn't kind of my, what I would do, you know. And uh, those those were the kind of band, you know, you don't need 24 tunes, you know, in, in a routine. So that's that's the only kind of stuff that I said, oh, man, this is going to be kind of rough. But I did it, you know. And uh, I don't know what kind of prizes they got. <laughs> <laughs> now, were there any other um, string band arrangers who you felt particular camaraderie with or you were particularly influenced by or you liked to listen to? Uh, any, anybody who influenced you or you like to bounce ideas off of over the years? Sure, man. Well, me and... We and me and Herbie about the same years. We were in the eighties, you know, eighties. And uh, he was my best competition. I love that cat, man. And we would just beat his, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, I gotta beat you, man. I, Herb, I'm gonna beat you. No, Ray, I'm gonna beat you. And we're such friends and we tried to get, that was the impetus to uh, write a little bit better than, you know, you know here's a song give me my money you tried to do the best you could and herbie was the cat man he uh, he had his own uh what is it uh, things that he brought to the string bands he changed the sounds see i was just a uh i loved the golden old sounds of the string bands three-part harmony with counter melodies counter melodies was my thing and uh well, I, I didn't even talk about how putting the, the arrangements together, the uh, transitions. We'll but but anyway, Herbie, big thing, he opened up the the harmonies. And he played with the big bands, you know, and, and he brought the big band sound into the string bands, you know, four-part harmony. And, and, uh, I, I would always play two beat basses on my stuff, but he, he brought in the st a swing four beat bass, drums, uh, modern chords so he, he he really changed it around. he was the good man and he opened it up where i kind of was uh, uh stuck it wasn't stuck i want i love the old style you know i could write the new style i think there i there were some tunes uh, themes that you had to uh uh, there were songs in that scene that you had to play like a modernistic style. It wasn't all vaudeville, you know, you had to do what you had to do. And certain things, themes were Latin, so you had to write different, know how to write different styles. So I just didn't stick to, you know, uh, 1920s or 30s styles. Are there any particular shows of yours or bands that you wrote for that really stick out in your mind as man those were some great years that i wrote or i great great involvement with that particular band during that era um well, not really there was certain every band had a, a something good to say you know yeah you said that sometimes so how would a band approach you they would they would say we need a theme and how would you work with those bands to develop the music would you just give them music would they how much of an outline would they typically give you i, I Back in the old days, Tommy, well, I don't know. He, I don't know if he came to me. But anyway, they said after, what was it, the Labor Day or something? What in the hell would they so do? It was up around August. Oh, yeah. So they come, they say, Ray, can we have a, a you know, a meeting with you? Okay. So some of the guys would come over to my house. You know, I had a bar over there. What are you going to do, fellas? Well, our thing is so we're going to be uh, chickens. Okay. Uh, what do you got? Uh, how many tunes you got there? Okay, chicken reel, uh, chicken stomp, chicken soup, and all this here. And then uh, I said, okay, uh, is there anything uh, on these tunes that you need, like uh, cues? Is every anybody going to kick their foot up at a certain time, or uh, certain back steps, or going to do a waltz on this one? Or no, 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 you take it, Ray. Okay, that was it. And then that would that would be five minutes. They discuss it. That's it. Yeah. And they they throw it to me. And I had this chicken theme that I had to think about. You know, and I I would say, okay, this. My thing was you can't play two 
tunes in the same key, you know, you got, and you got to vary them. So, and the thing's got to build, it's got to, you know, uh, music has to have drama and excitement. So that's, I, I say, how can I do that from beginning? It's like writing a, a story. How the hell can I do that? So I would just sit with these themes and bang them around my head. And, what am I going to do here? You know, somehow it comes out. <laughs> I don't know. You hope. Would you tend to write when you'd write? Would you tend to write from the beginning to the end in order, or would you usually jump around when you'd have an idea? Or how did you tend to do them? Uh, no, I I would sketch the whole thing out like in my head first. I'd say, well, this is a good thing here, and then this is all right here. Okay. And then I'd scratch it out, you know, uh, with the start with a, just a melody line and a bass line. My biggest thing was modulations and transitions between tunes. You know, I don't even hear that nowadays. It's just a drum thing or something. But the old timers, uh, the, the craft of arranging was, can, do you, can you have a nice introduction? Can you have good modulations between tunes and can you be it make smooth transitions in rhythms that was so difficult writing the tune was easy but getting from one tune to the other was kind of figured out raymond come on let's do it you can do it so uh yeah that, that was a fun you know and 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 i'd sketch it you know uh until uh, I had like the whole damn thing right there to sketch, bare skeleton. And you know, uh, harmonizing it, we could do that. And uh, my wife, she, she I had the piano there and I would play this transition, maybe four bars. Oh, I asked the guys uh, beforehand, fellas, we're not just gonna play one tune into the other. Could you give me like five seconds between tunes to set it up? To modulate between tunes, yeah, Ray, you you do whatever you got to do. So uh, I'm playing a the piano there, and my wife says, "What the hell's wrong with you? You're playing the same goddamn eight bars like for two hours. That was the transition. <laughs> See, I'm work. I had to work it right from one song to the other, and I would sit like it, it would take time, man. That's that's the biggest thing. Those transitions." Yeah. And then finally, I said, yeah, God damn, I got it, man. <laughs> you know, and then you'd work on the next tune and make sure that goes smoothly into the next, you know. And then it's building up and building up. Oh, man, this drama's going. I got the excitement. And then at the end, you had to have that big finale. Smack them, man. The, the sock boys. And did you build up to that, Ray? Did you get there? You know, did you give enough contrast in, in tempos? Did it get to that point where the people got to jump up in the air at the end? If you didn't, you lost. So every arrangement that I did, it, it had to have it. You hope it did. Bam! You know, it worked. Right. You know. But that was the thing. Like, it was a lot of fun. Like, building this song, building the whole arrangement. Absolutely, yeah. How long would it take you to write a routine? I mean, I'm sure it varied maybe a little bit depending on what you had going on, but did you consider yourself to be a pretty quick writer? I know some people no. say that took them no, a long I'm, time, I'm, other people. I'm, I'm slow. So if you gave me uh, five tunes to do, uh, you know, from going to school, you got to do research work on your, your project. So, uh, okay, Blue Skies. Okay, that's a good tune. First off, try to get a, a decent uh, lead sheet on it, you know. And then after that, get as many recordings of that song that you could find. And make sure you got the right uh, melody, and write chords and you after you listen to all these those arrangements we're arrangers you pick from here you pick from there you boom, 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 bam you try to make your own arrangement of that 
nice counter melody in between. And uh, that's how you write a song. That's the song. That's not the transitions or, you know, the modulation. The songs take uh, research work. Say right now, you say, what are you doing right, right now? I'm writing an arrangement of a tune. I looked at 10 re uh, recordings of it. And each one is different. Right. right. It's research work. So you say, well, what, what do you think? And you get the lead sheet and that's wrong. So, uh, you know, you, you got to put together what you think is the right thing from all your research work. Like going to college, you're going to write a, 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 you know what it is, you know, writing a paper, you do a lot of research work. So anyway, every tune takes research. You just don't say, oh, baby face. Okay, I know baby face. Let's make it something else, man. You know. You know, find out all these different arrangements of it and copy it and transcribe them, you know. Now, when you think about making something different then, and you'd sit down with a lead sheet, mm -hmm. how, how would you think about that arrangement after you listen to all these things? Would you think, well, let me look at this lead sheet and let me think about the chords and how I can change those chords? Or uh, would you think about, let me think about changing the, under, the, harp, the rhythmic underpinning or let me yeah. think about what sorts of things would you would you think about to change? It would be the, the, the colors, the, mm -hmm. you know, different colors, or it could be the rhythm, rhythmic backgrounds, or uh, breaks that you could put in there. Uh, I, I don't mean break. I mean uh, two bar solos for this guy. Yep. You know, have the uh, tenor sax take it here, and you know, it's a, a contrast, a lot of contrast, and and uh, uh, take two bars in a different key just for two bars and then take it back you know and 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 do something that's surprising and and it not and it don't hurt anybody's ears but make them like say what what, what happened there that, 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 that's a little different yeah that's good man. you know and uh, so that's that's the thing that you you really have to work on how about reharmonization? Have you done a lot of reharmonization? Uh, not in the string band stuff, you know, in the jazz stuff you can, you know, take a jazz tune, you know. I remember you, bang, you know, or uh, Stardust. You could really do a thing on that, man, D flat. But the string bands, uh, you have to, you got banjo players, man, you know. And uh, I never dig this, man. I, I don't think there were one or two occasions where I ever wrote a C major seventh chord or C major ninth chord or C minor seventh chord for banjo players. Yeah. Because I know they don't know them. Right. They write a minor. Yeah. And yeah. all the 1920s music and the string band music is straight ahead, man. The you know, horns are hitting that minor. They're not uh, advanced harmonically. Yeah. And, and I can write that way, but uh, you know, it's it has to be a an out theme. You know, I can't think of one. Jonathan, yeah, yeah. So some of the themes I know Ray forgets and everything, but I'm just going to bring something into the picture. He always says he writes three parts, and which he does. You know, and he has the battery switching around and making you know all the chord changes and so forth and so on. But he did his theme for Paul Jamer again when he did the. Uh, magical theme well that was a magical theme so you had to get like sort of like you know take it out a little bit you know mm -hmm. sorcerer's ball here we go let me see if oh, I can... that's it that's it oh, right okay. all right let me see if i can let me see if i can play this i'm going to just try to put it up here just a second bear with me let's see what we got here. Nice. Yeah, that's a little bit out. That was a three-part harmony. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good stuff.
Do you have 81 when they did the Toy Land Comes Alive? That was another one that was just unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable. They disco, like the first band that really did it right. I don't. All right. I have the ice cubes and beer polka. <laughs> no, no. Beer polka. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Oh yeah, Ray. That's well, that was that was an example of one of those tunes that they had the lead sheet and bastard harmony. That wasn't. My favorite. <laughs> <laughs> That's some good ones. Um, that was not your arrangement. All right, just no. for for the record, that was not Ray's arrangement. He is not responsible for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I so. How do you think your sound changed from when you started writing to when you stopped writing? Do you think you uh, evolved? Well, yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, I think yeah. you evolved, but I'd like to know what you think. Well, yeah, at, at, at the beginning was, you know, you know, the bands, all we did was play four numbers and uh, drums in between, you know, roll off between. I enjoyed playing, well, I enjoyed playing at the end there. I mean, arranging at the end, because you, you took more chances, you know, and you didn't know it would... Uh, if it would come off or not. One example was uh, Marty Baldwin was a, a beautiful uh, bass saxophone player for Furco. And uh, I took a chance, the whole band played, and I gave him a solo for how many bars? I don't know, two, four bars or something? Yeah. Would it come out? Would it come across? I don't know. You could kill me if it didn't. But he played so beautifully that it did the back. It's just one, one bass sax playing or something. Wow. So different. You, know, you got to take this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, the stuff you did, you know, just talking about that, it was so, you know, thinking about what you did in, with Furco in the 90s. Um, Barnyard was just such a great was such a great fun show. And I just, I can imagine you must have had just so much fun writing that because yeah had that's just, that's example of I'm, like it's just having fun i'm gonna play a little bit of that now ray this is actually the midi file that you sent me and i think you know i like these midis because you can actually hear a lot of the parts that you wrote where you actually miss a lot of this stuff on new year's day with the new year's score when you hear the band play it you miss some of the finer nuances of your midi you sent me these years ago um here's a little sing sing swing also another one of um my and so many others favorites now this this one is a little different from what got played on new year's day and this was your original but the new year's day recording that furco wound up playing got modified a little bit i want to talk a little bit about that too because this is your midi demo and the final version got edited a little bit both are unique but there's little pieces that are in here that never made the final cut which i love so i'm going to play it. And I, I'm going to just pause for a minute. Also say, I love that you can hear all the little parts that you really, it's hard to appreciate on the TV camera recordings. And unfortunately we don't have a lot of great old recordings from these things. So once they're gone, they're gone. But on these middies, you can really hear all those great moving lines and all the fun stuff you wrote. So I'm, I'm just sorry to interrupt. <laughs> this transition. That's great stuff. You 
sent chills down everybody's uh, spine with this particular segment. I would like to just kind of wrap things up here because I, I know we've been going for a long time, but any uh, other pearls of wisdom you would give to others who are learning, wanting to learn to arrange or any just key take home points that you found to be helpful over the years? Or You got to make it exciting, you know, and build it up like a story. Lots of luck. <laughs> it, t- it takes a while, man, but I'm still working at it, you know, but I had a lot of fun. Well, what are you up to these days? What are you doing musically? What I was actually playing with, I was playing with like six different bands and every one had uh, a different style. I was working with a society band down in uh, Delaware, strictly two beat, Lester Lanning type, you know, piano with a big band. Uh, in the hood in Philly, man, I worked with a black group. Uh, Napoleon Black and Marion Salam, and it's uh, fusion jazz, and that's beautiful, man. People are beautiful. They really, uh, really enjoy playing. It's it's all uh, improvised music, you know. I went there one time, and, and they called a tune, say, Ray, we're going to play this tune. And I said, man, I don't know it, man. I, they said, don't worry, man. Just play a, a B-flat pedal and play anything you want on top. <laughs> and and my big thing now is uh, what are you studying ray you know how are you gonna you gotta i study every day uh, i'm studying balkan music now really what yeah is it? balkan yeah i i had that, that you know that dna test and uh so i'm 60 60 percent uh eastern european which is polish and ukrainian yep and I'm yep. 25% Baltic, which is Lat- Lithuanian and yep. uh, Belarus or uh, Belarus. Sure. And I'm 15% uh, Balkan, which is Romanian, Moldov- Moldavian, and, uh, you know, Serbian. Western music is all major and minor modes. But the Balkans go into crazy modes. They're really cool. Man. They're like... Uh, Oh, man. That's amazing. Double harmonic scales. And from there, you find different chord patterns. Hello, it's Vida Spinkiewicz. And in this training, I will teach you about a very special kind of scale. It's called double harmonic scale, major or minor, two different kinds. The reason it's called double harmonic is because two tetrachords are not major but harmonic here lower and upper it's it's a very interesting mode very interesting mode it's it's used um, in 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 uh, in the folk music of balkans of of the peninsula of Arabia, uh, in Muslim music, in uh, in a- a- Arabic music, in ancient uh, Hindu music as well. Very exotic sounding scale. And, and it's really interesting, man. So that's what I'm studying now. Wow. And uh, the other thing is improvisation. That's the big thing. Pick a tune, man, and just beat the shit out of it with, with ideas. And I'm 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 old enough to I don't care, man. I'll play the wrong notes to get get the get a different sound, you know. Yeah. So, so improv, improvisation is what's uh, uh, I get called for. Like most of the jazz groups, they want you to play, you know, uh, new ideas and stuff. So that's that's what I do, improvising. Well, I'll tell you, you are truly an inspiring guy. And, <laughs> you know, you, you, you really, and, and the fact that you're continuing to learn is just a testament, I think, to just your, your mind. You know, you, you have an active mind and you've done some amazing things and you continue to do some amazing things. So it's really, uh, you're, you're inspiring to a lot of people. And again, as I, as I say, you've been a huge influence on so many of us over the years and will continue to be. And, um, it's just such a pleasure and honor to talk with you. I really, uh, really love hearing your story. Thanks for having me on this. Yeah, really, really great, Ray. Thank you so much. And I'm um, looking forward to having a drink with you sometime and playing some music. 
All right, man. Keep on swinging. You betcha. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Ray Mollick. As always, please reach out to me if you have any questions or comments. I'd love to hear from you.